Hi everyone and welcome to my channel Babbling Books. My name is Elaine and if it's your first time here, welcome. Um, hopefully you are a returning viewer. Um, I'm starting to get a few of those which is very exciting. So this video is going to be um, my mid-year freak out or my mid-year wrap up, whichever one you prefer. I'm going to discuss my um, 10 favorite books so far this year. Um, since I'm putting this up a little late, I really wanted to include some of the books that I read in this month in July because I, I'm almost certain at least one of them is going to make my favorites of the entire year, but I decided not to cheat. So I will talk about that book in my regular July monthly wrap up. Um, the other thing is, is I am a donator. So if I read a book and <clears throat> whether or not I loved it or liked it, if I don't think I'm going to read it again, I will um, either donate it to my library or put it in the, um, the little library near our community center. So I only have three physical copies of the books I'm going to talk about. Some because I've given them away and also because a few of them were audiobooks or are audiobooks. So to get started in no particular order, I'm going to use my little page here for a reference to make sure I don't miss any. We are going to start with the girls. That's right. <laughs> the Girls I've Been by Tess Sharp. So this is a YA thriller. The main character's name is Nora. And Nora has had a very interesting upbringing. Her mother is, was a con artist and she raised Nora to be a part of the con. So throughout Nora's life, she assumed different personas to help her mother con men. And the main plot is that Nora, her current girlfriend and her ex-boyfriend are all in a bank together when a bank heist begins. And Nora uses her skills to try to keep everyone safe, to try to get control of the situation, um, and to try to you know save herself and her loved ones. So while you're reading that timeline, there are flashbacks to the different personas that Nora has been, all the girls that she's been. Um, I found the past timelines and the current timelines just as interesting. Um, and in some ways, I enjoyed the flashbacks more where you learned about the past Noras. Um, so I really do recommend this one. Um, I really, really loved it. I immediately went and um, checked out other books by the author, added it to my TBR list. I passed this one on to my son, which is why I don't have a copy of it. Um, but he is having a problem locating it. So I'm just gonna have to insert a picture here. So. And then after that, like I said, these are not in any particular order. I don't like um, putting my my books in order of favorites unless I'm doing it within like subgenres. So my favorite thriller, my favorite romance, my favorite horror, sci-fi, whatever. But I don't like lumping all those genres together and having to put them in order. So I'm not going to do it. <laughs> All right, and then next, um, I listened to this on audio. This is Eternal Life by Dara Horn, or Dara Horn. This was absolutely lovely to listen to on audio. So the main character, her name is Raquel, and <sighs> trying to make sure I don't do a spoiler. She is over 2,000 years old and you find out exactly how that came about and also what is currently happening in her life. The writing is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I actually wrote, what did I write specifically? Um, 
Oh, it's hauntingly beautiful. That's what I wrote because there's a very bittersweet feeling because when Markel is talking about something from her past, of course, those people did not live to be 200 or excuse me, 2000 years old. So there's a lot of um, people that she has loved and cared for that have died. So it has a very bittersweet feeling, um, almost romantic, except of course, it's not all, you know, sunshine and rainbows. But I loved this. Listening to it on audio was absolutely fantastic. It was both engaging and soothing. Um, and I really enjoy books that um, have a character that is, for the lack of a better term, I'm going to say immortal. Um, so I really highly recommend this one. And I would happily read another book by this author. I think I may have added one to my TBR list, but I'm not sure. And then um, I talked about this book in my last wrap up. So I read this in June. And that is All the Ugly and Wonderful Things by Bryn Greenwood. A lot of people hate this book, which is perfectly fine because the subject matter is verging on abhorrent. So you have a young girl named Wavy and a young man when the book starts um, named Kellen. And Wavy's stepfather is like the head of a meth organization in this small town um, in the 1970s. And make sure I got that right. Mm. Late 1970s, early 1980s. And Kellen works for Wavy's stepfather. Well, Kellen has a motorcycle accident. They're all bikers. And Wavy helps him and they form a friendship Nobody cares about Kellen. Um, and Wavy's stepfather is physically abusive. Her parents are drug addicts and alcoholics. Everyone else around them are drug addicts and alcoholics. And Wavy has an incredibly difficult life. And so Kellen starts to try to take care of her, buy her shoes, um, pay for groceries, just whatever he can because he feels very bad with the way her life is. And they form an incredibly tight-knit friendship. And then as Wavy gets older, she starts having romantic feelings for Kellen. Now, at this point, Kellen is probably in his mid to late 20s. And Wavy is like 14. And so there is quite a bit of discomfort when you're reading this. But I think the writing is absolutely beautiful. I loved the characters. I liked the uniqueness of the story. Um, and there were times where I was disturbed, but I just kept thinking these two people, if this relationship is not normal, but their situation is not normal. It's not normal for a, you know, nine-year-old little girl to be doing the cooking and the cleaning and and taking care of her sibling and, you know, having to clean up vomit from your drug addict mother and all these things. And so none of it was normal. So it made sense for them not to have a normal relationship, but that could be triggering for a lot of people. And while I did not feel that there was any grooming, there um, is at least two relatively descriptive sexual encounters between Wavy and Kellen before Wavy is 18 years old. So just be warned um, because I do think a lot of people would be very um, upset or disturbed by this. And you know, that that's fine, um, obviously. But I very much enjoyed this and I do recommend it because um, I thought it was very, very good. And then hoping me flipping through the pages here is not making like a ton of loud noise. And then I read Love in a Headscarf by uh, Shalina Zahara Jan Mohammed, or maybe Jan Mohammed. So this is a nonfiction book. Um, it's written by a, um, a British woman who is a very modern woman, but also a devout Muslim. And the book focuses on quite a few topics, but most of it is about, sorry, 
my daughter is practicing her gymnastics. If you heard that, that was her on her mat. Anyway, um, where was I? <laughs> um, oh, Shalina decides that she is going to go the more traditional route and use a matchmaker for an arranged marriage. So you get to read about what that is like. Um, and at the same time, Shalina is struggling with being a modern woman and a devout Muslim woman. And she's starting to try to work out why um, some of the cultural things conflict with the religious teachings of um, Islam. And so there's a lot of just, a lot of really great conversations. I really enjoyed it. There was um, a lot of really funny moments. You root for Shalina. Sometimes you're thinking, you know, she meets this guy and you're like, oh my God, please don't let this be the guy she marries. Um, so I really enjoyed this. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, and I ended up donating this to um, the little library near our community center because I wanted to pass it along um, because it was very good. And then I listened to House of Corrections by Nikki French. Um, so this is a British author. Actually, when Nikki French is a husband and wife team, but they are, um, they're British. And in this particular book, a young woman named Tabitha, she is a very unlikable character. Um, nothing really, she's not friendly. She's almost rude, dismissive of other people, abrasive. Um, she's much smarter than you assume her to be. Um, and one day, a body is discovered in her shed, and she is arrested. And she is put into, um, I'm going to call it a prison, a house of correction. And she is to stay there until her trial is over. So she does not want to take the advice of her lawyer. She fires her lawyer and decides that she's going to defend herself. And in doing so, that earns her certain rights. And she is really um, rubbing all the um, prison employees the wrong way with her demands. But she is determined to defend herself and prove that she did not do this. So even though she's an unlikable character, you do start rooting for her. I really enjoyed this one. This is probably my favorite Nikki French um, standalone. And I do recommend it because it was very enjoyable and um, I thought the audiobook was a lot of fun. And then another book from last month. Um, so I did speak about this one in more detail in my June wrap up, but this is These Witches Don't Burn by Isabel Sterling. So this is a um, YA urban fantasy thriller, basically. Um, you have the main character whose name is, that is a good question, what is her name? Hannah. So Hannah is an elemental witch. Her family lives in Salem, Massachusetts. There are a lot of other elemental witches in Salem, Massachusetts. And in this world, witches are not allowed to expose their magic to regs, which is just another term for muggles. And Hannah had a past incident with a blood witch that terrified her of all blood witches. And one day she suspects that there is a blood witch in Salem, Massachusetts, but none of the elders in her magic clan will believe her. So she decides to investigate and she's going to prove it to the elders so they can do something about it. Um, Hannah's ex-girlfriend is also an elemental witch. Um, her best friend is a dancer and her... Um, Oh, and she's a muggle. The best friend is a muggle. She has no idea about magic. And then there's a love interest that shows up. So um, there's a lot of um, inclusivity. So you have um, Hannah is obviously gay. The love interest is bi. There's a trans character. Um, and it didn't feel forced. It felt very natural to have all of those types of people included. I didn't feel like it was um, a device the author was using to sell um, more books. Um, so I really recommend this. There is a sequel that I enjoyed as well. And I really hope that this turns into a very, very long series because I absolutely loved it. 
magic system is simple, um, but still enjoyable. So very much recommend that one. All the books on here are going to be re recommended very much because it's my favorite book so far. Let's see. What is next? Then we have another nonfiction. So I, um, I read a copy of this and I ended up donating it to the Little Library and the Community Center. So this is Fed Up by Gemma Hartley. So this is a conversation, a collection of essays about how the emotional and unseen labor usually falls on the wife in a relationship. And there, it is discussed, and even in um, any romantic partnership, whether it, it is same sex or or whatever, um, there's always one person that ends up doing most of the unseen labor and shouldering most of the emotional burden, not only for themselves, but for their partner and their entire family and at work. And I will say that this very much, Gemma talks about her own personal experiences, things her friends have told her. So it's not really like she sat down and did 65 interviews. So the scope is pretty narrow. However, there was a lot of very interesting things in here. Um, I highlighted some things and talked to my husband about them and asked him what he thought. So, you know, if you're interested um, in maybe trying to <laughs> talk to your partner and explain to them what um, a, an unseen labor is, this is a really great book for that because it gives you the right vocabulary, there's examples. Um, so I do very much recommend this one. I, um, I'm i a huge, huge supporter of, even though I'm a stay-at-home mom, um, you know, so I don't work outside the home, but I'm a huge supporter of women who are tired of being the entire frontal lobe for their families. And this book is a really good, um, you know, starting step in regards to discussing that. Um, so very much recommend that one. And then I read The Wives by Taryn Fisher. And actually, you know what? I listened to this on audio. Um, so this is a thriller. And the main character's name is Thursday. And she shares her husband with two other women. And I can't remember which day the other women had, so I'm just going to call them Sunday and Friday. So Thursday doesn't know anything about the other wives. They live in a home somewhere. Um, she doesn't know what they do for a living. She doesn't even know their names. She refers to them as does her husband, as Sunday and Friday. And one day, Thursday, because she's our main character, she's, um, she's the only point of view, Thursday finds a receipt in her husband's pocket, and it gives her the identity of one of the wives, and she starts to stalk her on social media and then drive by her house and then meet her and it just spirals into all of these different events. Um, I did not see the plot twist um, and you really will find yourself doubting everything that you're reading. Um, so I really, really did enjoy this and recommend it if you like um, thrillers like that because, you know, it was good. And then, let's see, the last book I have a physical copy of. This is another nonfiction. It's called A World Undone, uh, The Story of the Great War from 1914 to 1918. So I have been struggling for a few years to find a good, concise book on World War One. Now, there are some very specific things about this book in particular that make it such a good read. So if you, if you are reading about, um, 
uh, like, let's see here. If you're reading about um, one of the um, Romanovs, for instance, if, if it comes up and when you're learning about exactly what the ambassadors, because, you know, at this time in World uh, World War One, before World War One. All of those different powers in Europe were scrambling to figure out what's this country going to do? What's this country going to do? Which one are we going to support? And sometimes, you know, they'll mention a name or an occurrence and you won't, you'll be like, who, what is that? And um, what this author does that makes it so fantastic is he has these little background sections. So if he brings up something for instance, the Romanovs, and that's an area that you don't have a lot of knowledge about. He has a section called background, and you can read all about whatever that is so that you're not lost. And I found that to be incredibly useful because, for instance, there was something called um, the Junkers, and I had no idea what that was. And so thanks to the little background information, our section, I was not completely lost in spending an hour Googling and reading Wikipedia articles. The only um, really negative thing about this book is that I think the, um, the s conflicts outside of Europe are very much overlooked. They are mentioned, and in a few cases mentioned in detail, but not nearly as ex extensive as the Eastern and Western fronts. So if you are looking for a book that focuses more on anything happening in the Middle East um, or Asia, um, Africa, anything like that, this is really not a great option. This is very Eastern and Western front heavy. If you are new to World War I and you don't know where to start, this is an absolutely amazing option. The author, for lack of a better term, holds your hand um, through the basics and does a good basis and then builds up on that basis so that you are not, you don't feel like you're just thrown right in the t into the middle of the situation and you have no idea what's happening. So I highly recommend this one for anybody that enjoys reading about history or wants to brush up um, on their uh, World War One history. Very good. I, I went and bought um, more books by that author in the middle of reading it because I was so impressed. And then lastly um, is another nonfiction book. This is America's War for the Greater Middle East by Andrew Bokovic. So, Andrew Bokovic, give me just a second. I believe this is the one that was written by, I think the author is retired. Yes, a graduate of West Point and a Vietnam veteran. Um, so this is written, so th this book here, it was is written by a um, Vietnam vet and a graduate of West Point. Um, when I read a lot of things about the military, I prefer if the author has had military experience because at least to me, it adds a level of um, legitimacy. And not to say you can't write military history if you haven't been in the military. I just think it adds just a little bit extra. Um, so anyway, so this book focuses on why and how America became so involved in the Middle East. So if you have ever wondered what in the hell are we doing over there, this is a really great place to start. Um, the majority of the book really focuses on um, all of the things in the 1970s when there was um, an embargo um, on, is that the right word, um, with the um, with the oil with Saudi Arabia. I believe I'm remembering that correctly. Don't come after me if I'm not. Um, but you've seen pictures of all those big cars in the 1970s lined up for miles trying to get gas, the gas crisis. Um, so in 1970s, big focus also again in the 1980, uh, 1980s, and then you have the Desert Storm in the 1990s, and then the more current um, post uh, 9/11. So I think this is a great, um, just general book about 
how and why America has so much involvement in the Middle East. It's right there in the title. Um, I found it easy to read. There were a few times that I um, had to make a note and do some separate reading, but that was pretty rare. Um, I think the author did a good job in giving um, background. And most importantly, I would not classify this as pro-American um, or pro-Middle East either. I think the author did a very good job in trying to do a middle-of-the-road factual analysis. There were many times where the author was incredibly blunt about a very, very dumb um, decision that the United States made regarding their Middle Eastern policies. So I recommend this one as well. Um, so I really hope you guys come back for my July wrap up because I have read some really good books this month and I'm really excited to talk about them. Um, I was so tempted to add them to, to this video, but that's cheating. <laughs> well, anyway, so, uh, thank you very much for clicking on my video and I hope everybody has a very lovely day and stays cool. Um, it has been over 95 degrees, over 100 degrees a few times. It is so hot and miserable. Um, I went and bought fish from the grocery store the other day. And I kid you not, I was worried about getting that fish home in my air conditioned car before it spoiled because it's so hot. I got into the car and the temperature gauge had the inside of my car at over, um, I think it was 100 and 116 degrees. It was so hot. Um, so we're mostly just staying in, um, and trying to keep cool. So anyway, I hope everyone's having a lovely summer and a lot of good things to read. Um, let me know what your favorites were for this, um, this year. I'm always looking for more books for my TBR. Thanks. Bye.